So halo canes, halogenation, and radical reactions, that we're, that's what we're working on in Chapter 8. This particular um, lecture is going to just talk about um, the radical halogenation. Uh, there's several different kinds, several different things we're going to be looking at. Um, a lot of this is going to sound repetitive, but the reality is even though it sounds repetitive because it sounds very similar, um, we are talking about significantly different ways that this can occur, that this um, radical halogenation can occur, and what the major products and minor products we would expect to see, whether or not it'll be a racemic mixture, etc. So when we're talking about radical halogenation, um, we're talking about racemic mixtures only if the carbon is a chiral carbon, okay, if it has a chiral center, um, or if it takes place at a hydrogen on a, on a chiral center. All right, so that's when we're going to get the racemic mixtures talking about R and S. So in this particular case, uh, what we see is that we have um, sec butyl radical and the carbon that has the unpaired electron, the, the radical carbon, that unpaired electron will occupy the sp2 orbital. Um, with a radical, we do get an sp2 hybridized um, uh, hybridization there. So let's talk about a couple of definitions first. Um, we're going to talk about allelic substitution, allelic carbons, and allelic hydrogens. So an allelic substitute, well first let's start with an allelic carbon. Um, an allelic carbon is a carbon that's next to the carbon-carbon double bond. So if here's the carbon-carbon double bond, this carbon right here is what we refer to as the allelic carbon. A hydrogen attached to the allelic carbon is an allelic hydrogen. So when we talk about allelic substitution, we're talking about a reaction where one atom or a group of atoms is substituted for something else. And it happens on the allelic carbon, not the double bond. The double bond still breaks, but the attachment is not on one of the carbons involved in the double bond. It's involved with the carbon next to the carbon with the double bond. So if I'm going to look at propene that's being added to um, or, or reacted with um, a chlorine atom, what we're going to get is, in this case, the double bond doesn't need to be broken because the first thing that happens is a hydrogen comes off of the allelic carbon. The hydrogen is removed, forming that, or making that carbon, that allelic carbon to have a radical, and then the radical comes in and breaks the bond between the two CLs. Okay, so this shared bond, um, one goes to this chlorine, which will then form a radical, and that will react with the radical formed by the hydrogen coming off of that allelic carbon. So then these will come together and form a bond. Okay, oh, where'd my radical go? There it is. And this one just becomes a radical in solution, which can bond with the allelic hydrogen that was removed. So you'll note, oh, by the way, you'll note here, we have an actual temperature. That's a pretty high temperature. That's going to become important. Because remember, with those radical conditions, meaning UV light, um, peroxides, high heat, all right, high heat changes, as opposed to room temperature, the way different um, reactions are occurring. So if I look here and I compare um, an addition of bromine in under high temperature conditions versus room temperature conditions in an inert um, solvent, what you're going to see is in high temperatures or those radical conditions, we're going to get the allelic substitution. Allelic substitution means it goes onto the allelic carbon because an allelic hydrogen has been removed, forming a radical on that allelic carbon. At room temperature in inert solvents, what we're going to get is the electrophilic addition where the double bond is broken and the bromines will attach 
to the carbons that were involved in the double bond. <clears throat> you can kind of think of this like um, anti-mark versus mark, all right? Now, we can do an allelic bromination um, with also what we call N-bromosuccinamide, short NBS. The structure looks like this before the reaction, and it's this bromine right here that's going to come in and attach itself to the allelic carbon. And in the end, what we're going to get is this um, hydrogen-saturated nitrogen, and we call this just plain old or ordinary succinamide. So you'll see in the product side, um, the bromine will attach to the allelic carbon. If this is our double, double bond, and we can kind of number it, one, two, three. Number three, that is our allelic carbon. And the hydrogens attached to that carbon are allelic hydrogens. If I numbered the other way, one, two, three, the blue three is also an allelic carbon. This is why we say we get a racemic mixture. Now, how does this really happen? Let's look at the mechanism. If you remember from the previous lecture, the mechanism is as such where a bromine radical is formed in some way, shape, or form. In this case with NBS, as opposed to Br2, it is still done in radical conditions. And, <clears throat> excuse me, no, I'm not sick. I do not have COVID-19. I'm just chewing pollen at, on these days and my allergies are just insane. Um, under high heat, this is where we get the radical condition. The bond is broken between the bromine and the nitrogen. So one of these shared electrons goes on to the nitrogen and one goes on to the bromine, leaving us a nitrogen radical and a bromine radical. Next, we have our chain propagation. So what happens here if we have just some double bonded um, something or other, and here's our um, allelic carbon, the bond between the allelic carbon and the allelic hydrogen will break, putting one electron onto the carbon, one electron um, to the bromine. And the hydrogen will then attach to the bromine, getting rid of that bromine radical. Now we have an allelic carbon that has a radical, and that allelic carbon will go ahead and attach to a bromine from Br2. We'll talk about where Br2 comes from in just a minute. It just doesn't magically appear in solution, okay? There is a reason it's there. We'll talk about that in just a second on the next slide. Um, and the bond will break between these two bromines. Bromine attaches, and another bromine radical is formed. Now, remember when we talked about chain termination. Several things are happening at the same time. Now, the Br2 is what's necessary for the chain propagation. So what's happening here is when we get um, NBS and HBr in solution, we're going to get this, the succinamide, and that's where the Br2 is being formed. So remember, you have to always remember, we're only writing one example of a reaction, but there are billions of these occurring in a beaker or a flask or what have you, okay? So two of these are forming two bromine radicals, which we saw right here. So two of those are forming a radical, and in the end, those radicals, those Br radicals, will come together and form Br2. So yes, the Br that's being attached is from the NBS, but not directly. It's an indirect from the NBS. So back to steps four, five, and six. All of these are occurring. You have two bromine radicals that are coming together to form Br2, and those bromines are coming from NBS and HBr. Well, where's the HBr coming from? Well, this hydrogen 
and this bromine radical, which was formed here, is going to form HBr. So bromine radicals are formed. Bromine uh, Br2 bromine ion is, or I'm sorry, bromine is, is formed. Then the radical from the allelic carbon will go with the bromine, forming this. And then finally, we can get two radicals that'll form a longer chain. Okay? All three things are occurring. Now, we have to talk about this um, allelic radical. So we have two equivalent contributing structures. Either way, they're equally going to contribute because they're equally going to happen. So if I have um, a double bond and it's one, two, and three, I can get the radical on carbon three allelic carbon, or we can get a switcheroo. You can see how it's on this allelic carbon also. The position of the radical electron, um, it'll predict the reactivity. All right. So it says here, and this is an important bullet, that in the two contributing structures, it will predict that radical reactivity will occur at carbons one and three, but never carbon two. So again, here's your structure before um, any allelic reaction of NBS. And in the end, once it's all said and done, the reacted finished product will be this. And this is just your succinamide. You'll note, we've looked at the structure of NBS, both before and after the reaction, several times. In fact, I have a whole slide just on its structure. That should mean it's important to you also. Wink, wink. Okay, so here's an example. How can we account for the fact that we're going to get a racemic mixture here? And by the way, which one is going to be the most, um, the majority uh, product? So when we look at one octene and we react it with NBS in inert solution, non-radical conditions, most people would think, hmm, well, I guess that secondary bromination, uh, the, the bromination on the secondary carbon would be more stable than the bromination on the primary carbon. All right. So you would think this would be the larger um, uh, product amount than this. The answer is that because of the fact that it's NBS, this is going to be your uh, primary product, your major product. Okay. Most of the reason with that has to do with size and reactivity. So let's take a look. Your rate determining step of this radical chain mechanism is the hydrogen being taken off the allelic carbon. Okay, so the rate determining step is the hydrogen, the allelic hydrogen being removed from the allelic carbon. All right, and in one octene, that gives you a secondary allelic radical as opposed to a primary. So it's stabilized by the delocalization of the two pi bonds. Remember, we talked about um, uh, the hybridization of the radical would be sp2, okay? And um, the reaction of the radical at carbon one is the major product. We'll, we're going to look at the reaction mechanism in just a second. Um, and the reaction at carbon three gives the minor product. So the more substituted or the more stable alkene, alkene isomer predominates. Why? What is happening? So let's look at the reaction mechanism. Here we got one octene. 
uh, we have, uh, they did not show the formation of the bromine radical. That's already been done in this solution. All right, so if you're still having trouble with that, go back to where we talk about how that radical with NBS is formed. And if you're still confused, go to the Organic Tutor and YouTube he, and type in alkene with NBS. And he's got like 18 videos and they're very well done. Highly recommend if you're struggling with this to go watch those videos. Okay. Um, now, once the bromine radical is formed, the double bond breaks. And you can see that here. The double bond breaks. And by the way, I'm just going to number these for reference throughout this um, explanation. One, two, three. Oh. Okay. The other thing they did not show you on this slide is the actual allelic hydrogen being removed. When that allelic hydrogen was removed, carbon-3 got the radical. So what you see is the double bond being broken and being reformed between carbon-1 and 2. Okay. Um, I see an error on this slide. Um, right here, this double bond should have been put here, okay? And I can't fix it because it's a picture. So just know that, yes, that double bond should be between carbon 2 and 3, all right? So the double bond between carbons 1 and 2 is broken. One of these shared electrons from the double bond goes to carbon 1. One of the shared electron goes between carbon two and three, and the radical goes between two and three. So now our double bond is shifted <clears throat> between um, carbons two and three, and the bromine attaches to carbon three, all right? Now, the second thing that can happen is here we get our double bond between carbon two and three. Oh, that's not an error. I see what they did. Sorry, these pictures are terrible. I get them right from, uh, right from Pearson. Um, not Pearson, Cengage. All right, so let me re-explain this. Back up a little bit. I see exactly what they're doing here. Here is where they're showing you the contributing structures. All right, so once my allelic hydrogen is removed, the, the one I circled on carbon-3, once it's removed, there's a radical on carbon-3. It can shift equally between the radical being on carbon one or the radical being on carbon three. If you remember the contributing structures, uh, here it is, this, uh, no. Here, remember these contributing structures where it can go back and forth between carbon one and carbon three, but the radical will never be on carbon two. Okay, that's what they're doing here. And it's a terrible picture to show that because it even confused me how they were doing the picture. Um, so my box is where they're showing the contributing structures. So if I were to have um, the radical on carbon-3, if it stays on carbon-3 and bromine comes in, we're going to get bromine attached to carbon-3. If the radical of the contributing structure occurs, meaning radical on carbon-1, then bromine will add to carbon-1. And another bromine radical will be formed, and that will actually form HBr with the hydrogen radical that was removed from the allelic carbon. Okay? All right. So the reason we have such regioselectivity, let me just erase that there, is because of resonance. Resonance matters. Resonance of the allelic radical matters. And the resonance contributor shows that the more substituted double bond dominates. So the more that the double bond is dominant, the more that the double bond is um, substituted, that's the dominant major product. So 
it all circles around spin density. We're not going to get into that here. Um, that's more reserved for physical chemistry. Um, but just understand that uh, spin density is the reason for this. And terminal carbons have the highest spin density. We'll talk about ter terminal carbons in another lecture. Okay, so I suggest going through these and seeing what you would expect as an answer. Okay, which of the following is not the product of a radical chain reaction of 2-pentene? That's 2-pentene. Okay, so which would you not expect to be the product? Okay. See if you can figure it out. The answers should be in the back of your textbook because these are in your textbook as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. I also suggest you look through these. What is the best reagent to carry out this transformation? Which of the following molecules would not yield the desired organolithium reagent when treated with lithium and pentane? Actually, we didn't know. You don't have to do this one. Just kidding. I should have read it first. Sorry. All right. Now let's talk about auto oxidation. Um, auto oxidation means that oxygen is necessary um, and no other oxidizing agent. Oxygen is a fantastic oxidizing agent. So if something requires oxygen, then we won't use any other oxidizing agent. It also is radical chain mechanism, similar to the allelic bromination, but not exactly. Um, so we're going to look at the auto oxidation of the hydrocarbon chains of fatty acid esters, specifically fatty acid esters. So if I have an unsaturated fatty acid, fatty acid ester, um, typically we're talking about chains of 16 or 18 carbons that have the 1,4 diene functional group. Okay, um, Radical abstraction of a double allelic hydrogen, meaning making a radical of, a, of two allelic hydrogens, meaning there's going to be two allelic carbons we're going to be talking about. Remember, the allelic carbons are the ones next to a double bond, not involved in the double bond. So there must be a 1,4 diene. All right. Um, then because we're talking about a double allelic hydrogen, meaning an allelic hydrogen from two allelic carbons, there must also, of course, be two allelic carbons. All right. So what's going to go on here? First, we got to get the radical initiator, whatever halogen radical, okay? Um, that will very easily take away or remove an allelic hydrogen, okay? So one, two, three, uh, three, four, five, six. I totally, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. Uh, nope. They want that to be in our group. They don't care what it is. So let me just go eliminate this. Ah, research. Okay. All right. So once our radical comes in and this double bond breaks, one um, electron and the hydrogen will bond with the X, so we'll get HX. <coughs> and the other electron in the bond will go on to our carbon three to form a radical. Once that happens, and this is our product, what's going to happen is resonance. Okay, we're going to see that the radical and an electron from the double bond, I'm looking at the blue, a radical from the double, the blue double bond will come and form a new double bond here, putting the radical onto this carbon, 
which is what we see here, okay? Or the radical can go between carbons three and four and an electron from the double bond between four and five, I'm looking at the pink now, can come and form a double bond here, forming the radical here to get this. Either one can happen, okay? Now, once we have the radical, they're looking at, uh, it was, uh-oh, they're looking at this one on the next slide. Once we have a radical on an, an allelic carbon, this is where oxygen is going to come in, and it's going to form a peroxy radical, all right? So the radical is going to come in um, with uh, an electron from the oxygen, and they, they're not showing you the mechanism by which both oxygens become a radical. That's okay. Don't worry about that mechanism. The radical is going to come in and bond with the radical of one of the oxygens, forming this right here. It's going to be attached. And then the radical from the other oxygen is going to grab an electron and the hydrogen from some other allelic carbon. And we're going to get this formation and another radical carbon. Okay. The new radical reacts with the oxygen, causing a radical chain reaction. So when we talk about this, we're talking about um, lots of different things. So first of all, these products degrade to short chain aldehydes and the carboxylics very readily, very easily. Um, you get that rancid smell, it's gross, it, it smells like rotten eggs many times. Um, it says some are toxic, but many are toxic and or carcinogenic. Um, so oil, if it lacks the 1,4-diene structure, they are not very easily going to be oxidized. That 1,4-diene structure is what drives this oxidation. Um, we, can, we have lots of natural and man-made compounds that are what we call radical inhibitors. Radical inhibitors are just like what it sounds. It inhibits it's a radical that inhibits something. Um, we're talking about selectively reacting with a radical to remove a chain, like, like and to terminate the chain. We, we, we use these on purpose to change things and stop things. So there is a high preferential with the initial peroxy radical, and that's because we want resonance stability. Okay, so when we have resonance stability with a phenoxy radical, again, it's less reactive and survives longer. All right, here's just an example of how this is happening. So what products would you expect from the following reaction? We have some initiator. Remember, initiator means some halogen radical. Okay, what would you expect to be the major um, product and what would be the, st the stereochemistry if necessary? Pause this and see if you can work it out. Okay, here, so here's the solution. The major product is the more substituted double bond. The more substituted the double bond, the greater the product. All right, so remember, if I could n number these, one, two, three three, and also one, two, three. Remember, that double bond can shift positions, so I can either um, have a radical on that carbon or that carbon. That's how we get the addition there or the addition there. Now, the most substituted double bond is the one that joins the two rings together. If you draw all the hydrogens, you will see how that happens, okay? Um, so this is gonna be your major product, and you will get a racemic mixture. Now, if we compare radical addition of HBr to alkenes, we still have either Markinovs or non-Markinovs, or you know, anti-Markinovs uh, products. 
if I had radical conditions with HBR, I would expect my bromine to go on carbon one. The radical would have stayed on carbon one. With no peroxides or no radical conditions, I would expect it uh, to attach to the most stable radical that exists. So again, if I'm talking about um, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Okay. No radical conditions. BR goes on carbon number two. Radical conditions. BR goes on carbon number one. So let's talk about the anti-mark addition of HBR. <clears throat> so first, with our, um, our peroxide, we get the break between the two oxygens. All right. So there's a break between the two oxygens, that, that bond breaks, forming an oxygen attached to some carbon chain, and the oxygen is a, now a radical. We have two alkoxy radicals. So once we, ha we form an alkoxy radical, it's going to come in with HBr, form this, and leave a bromine radical. That bromine radical is going to start a chain propagation. A an electron from the double bond is going to hook up with bromine and attach itself and then put a radical on carbon number two. Then HBr is going to come in. That radical is going to grab the electron and hydrogen and hydrogen is going to satisfy that radical so it's no longer a radical. And I formed yet again another bromine radical from this right here. Chain termination, how do we stop all this? The bromines come together to form Br2. Um, also, this radical could have bonded with a bromine radical in solution, double brominating the um, the structure. We're talking about non-Markinoff here um, as we get a tertiary carbon radical. It's more stable than a primary, but it didn't brominate primarily on that tertiary uh, carbon radical. It didn't form a tertiary carbon radical until after the bromine was already attached to the primary carbon. So Generally, we say, you know, most stable intermediate. That's where it's going to do. But we're talking about anti-mark. So we can look at this many different ways. If we look at about a radical mechanism versus a polar mechanism, we would expect in a radical mechanism for the major product to be anti-mark. But in a polar mechanism, our major product is, follows Markinoff. Okay, reactive intermediates in both these cases will be tertiary because that is the more stable um, conditions. So whether it's a radical or a carbocation with the polar mechanism, radical mechanisms, we get a radical um, intermediate. With polar mechanisms, we get a carbocation intermediate. All right, so in both cases, it's the tertiary that um, is the most stable intermediate. But in radical mechanisms, we're going to get anti-mark, so the bromine goes to the less substituted carbon. But in polar mechanisms, we follow Markinoff, and the bromine will attach to the uh, most substituted carbon. So what do you think the product of the following reaction will be? Pause this, see if you can come up with an answer. The solution is we're going to get both a cis and trans um, of this radical intermediate. Okay. If you go back through the reaction mechanism, we saw that adding the bromine to um, the anti-mark carbon, right, 
or the what we would think would be the, the most substituted carbon, we don't actually get that. So again, if I start with my product and I number it one, or I'm sorry, so I start with my reactant and I say one, two, three. If we followed Markinoff, we would expect this addition there to be our greatest. But this is anti-Mark. So we would expect the major product to be on the on the first carbon. Go through these and see if you can figure out the proper sequence. We're not doing this. Okay. So I, I thought I only had one more lecture to put up for Chapter 8. I actually, I, I actually had two more. This was one. This is the third one of four. Um, I have one more. It's going to be, it should be significantly shorter. Um, and then I'll, I'll start working on uh, Chapter 9 this week. Um, I'm going to figure out your next test date. Uh, I'm going to kind of look and see what's happening. Don't forget, you still have discussion boards that you have to do once a week. Right now, you should only be able to see one. Um, at midnight on Sundays is when they will be available to you. It serves as your attendance for the week. So please do this, the discussion forums. Also, don't forget that the quote-unquote quizzes that I am putting up, um, they are to replace your homework. So you don't need to be doing what I put up for homework anymore. You need to be doing the quizzes instead. Um, and they are open to you at certain times. So even though I, I technically already have three quizzes up, you should only be able to see um, one right now. Uh, I'm going to open up Chapter 8 quiz as soon as I get all four lectures up. Okay, but they do have assigned due dates. Uh, if you have any questions, let me know. Shoot me an email. Thanks, guys. Hang in there.